next act, this is his second Skepticon. Please give a warm welcome to the amazing Keith Little Jensen. We'll see if we can make this one work. Kind of a little limiting. Is it live? This is the most professional opening I've ever done. Okay, while they work on their technical difficulties, I would like to propose that because we didn't start the way I would like to have, Lauren come up and do 10 push-ups again. Oh, you guys support that, okay. I don't think you can do it, that's what I'm saying. Well, I didn't see the first one, it doesn't count. <laughs> All right, now you gotta introduce me again. Ladies and gentlemen, this asshole. <laughs> hello, hello. I am this asshole. How are you, skeptics? Can you do another 10 push-ups while we... Uh, skeptics, I have something serious to talk to you about tonight. I need to ask uh, all of you to be with me on this one. There's something we need to do. There's something very important that skeptics need to do in the community. I know I joke a lot, but this is dead serious. Skeptics, we need to lie to the children. We need to tell lies to the children. This is very important that we start lying to kids. We can't be up on our moral high ground refusing to lie to the children or they are going to beat us, all right? They're telling the children ridiculous shit. They're telling them that the AIDS virus is smaller than the pores in a condom and therefore can get through the condom and that condoms don't protect you from AIDS because as we all know, viruses ride little fucking bicycles who travel on their own and don't need fluid. There's only one way to beat that and that is that we have to lie. We have to say, children, listen up. The reason that they're so afraid of condoms is that there's a loophole in the Bible and having sex with a condom doesn't actually count. <laughs> there's no actual genital contact. Fuck all you want. As long as you use a condom, you're a virgin on your wedding night. Have fun. Let's do it. Let's lie to the children. I'm glad you're with me on that one. We can make this a better world. They don't let me talk to kids. They don't let me talk to kids. I try to... I try to give good advice. I did drugs. I did alcohol. I have good advice to give about those things. I did them. They were a lot of fun. I stopped doing them because they got boring. The person that they have give the advice is always someone who fucked up and did them badly. And their advice is no good. Keith Richards coming out, don't do drugs, I did drugs. Yeah, Keith, I'll follow that advice. I wouldn't want to become a big fucking rock star and travel all over the world, have sex with pretty much fucking everyone. God, that sounds terrible. No drugs for me, Keith Richards. I would come out and tell the kids, listen, stay away from the white drugs, they tend to be trouble, and when you're high at like two in the morning, don't go to Denny's. That's practical advice, because you're high, it's two o'clock in the morning, Denny's is open, it sounds like a good idea, you get there, the food's overpriced, cops hang out there, that's a bad thing, the waitress is on way different drugs than you and she's gonna fuck with you. <laughs> it's just a bad idea, and then the little public service star would go across and that would be my message. <laughs> they don't let me talk to the kids, I would tell them, listen kids, masturbation, it's fucking awesome. There's <laughs> It's a nice relief of tension. It's fantastic. You should enjoy it. Uh, here's some advice, though. Uh, shampoo, not a good idea. <laughs> Don't use that. Conditioner, generally fine. Try to stay away from the mentholated stuff unless you want an extra kick. <laughs> Up on the more you know. <laughs> 
They don't let me talk to the children. <laughs> I love Christmas. I love the holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Thank you. A lot of atheists give me shit for this, and it's not fair. I get shit from both sides. I get shit from the atheists for celebrating Christmas. I get shit from the Christians for celebrating Christmas. They come up to me and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. You can't all of a sudden come in and celebrate now because it's something you like. You're not a Christian. You gotta take the good with the bad. Which is weird, because it's kind of admitting that there's a fair amount of bad. <laughs> you know? Like, what's their problem? They're like, oh, no, 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 mister. You can't have all that guilt-free masturbation and then step in at the last minute and get a gift-wrapped uh, gift copy of America's Best Comics. Forget it, no. <laughs> No way, you gotta get up early every Sunday. You gotta get up early every Sunday if you wanna get a red sock with one of those little reindeers that poops bits of chocolate when you push on the time quarters <laughs> on December 25th. And by the way, if there's any Christians here, I gotta give it to you guys. I fucking love the chocolate pooping reindeer. That shit is awesome. <laughs> You've got a good holiday, I just like to celebrate it with you. I'm there in the morning every December 25th with my little pooping reindeer because I love the thing so much that I always break it by February and then I can't wait to get another one in my stocking. And I just have it deliver its chocolate right into my mouth on Christmas morning, just like, ah, oh, this is so great. My family just laughs and laughs. Ah, happy birthday, baby Jesus. It's good stuff, Christians. You have a good thing there. We just want to celebrate it with you. And when Christians get, get bent on me celebrating Christmas, I feel like I have to explain atheism to them. You know, I'm like, hey, here's the deal. I'm an atheist, that means that I don't believe in God. That doesn't mean that I reject everything in the Bible. It doesn't mean that at all. There are parts of the Bible that are very beautiful to me. There are parts of the Bible that I really love. For example, this is part of the Bible where it says that you should go out in the woods and, and knock down a tree drag it into your house and, and stand it up and decorate it all up in astrological symbols. <laughs> Trying to do so right around the solstice, Saturnella, uh, Yule. Um, I love that part of the Bible. That's some good shit. I, uh, I love going out looking at the lights. Where I live in Sacramento, we have this very wealthy neighborhood called the Fabulous Forties. And I love going into the, the Fabulous Forties where they take my food budget for the year and spend it on their lighting displays. <laughs> and then in the wonderful, generous spirit of Christmas, they let us poor people come and look at their houses <laughs> until 10 p.m. And then we have to get the fuck out. <laughs> I take my mom and my wife and my daughter and we go and we look at the Christmas lights. And my mom is champing at the bit to get my daughter a nativity set. She says, I don't want to preach to her. I just want to tell her what we're actually celebrating. It's, it's my culture. I just want to share my culture with her. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool, Mom. And I want her to know about all the different religions of the world. Just not yet. You know, I think three is a bit young for her to know that she's essentially evil. And when she's born that way, <laughs> we'll die. Like, wait till she's 18. <laughs> and then you can talk to her. But I'm walking with my family, and my daughter sees a nativity set one of these beautiful plastic light up ones like Jesus would have wanted, uh, <laughs> being set up on a lawn. And it's, it's not all the way there. They'd only put up a few pieces. They had the, uh, they had the uh, troubled teenage uh, runaway couple that's central to the story. And, uh, and then they had the manger, but they hadn't put anything in the manger yet. And my daughter says, Daddy, Daddy, who are those two women? And why is their nest empty? <laughs> My mom pricks up her ears. And I said, oh, sweetheart, uh, the, the two ladies, uh, let me tell you about them. Uh, that's, that's Mary, and that's Mary's partner, Josephine. <laughs> and, um, well, their nest is empty, because uh, as it turns out, it's really hard to find a white baby in the Middle East. <laughs> so, I've been looking for a while. I, uh, I went to Santa Claus's funeral. I performed. I performed at Santa Claus's funeral. I'll back up a little bit. Um, my friend Dale played Santa Claus for a living. 
And Dale was one of these real beard Santa Clauses. He didn't stuff a pillow in his coat. He was a big dude, he had a big white beard. And if you don't think that America is a beautiful country, please listen closer to what I'm telling you. This man only worked two or three months a year. He made a good living, and his job was essentially not shaving and never saying no to dessert. <laughs> Dale had shit figured out. <laughs> so Dale was my, my daughter's first Santa. He insisted, we got pictures, it was adorable. Uh, and then he was her second Santa, and then he passed away. And Dale's widow is following Dale's wishes because Dale didn't want a sad funeral. He didn't want a sad funeral. He said, no, when I die, I want it to be a party. I want my friends to just come and have a good time and celebrate life. He wanted a funeral. That's what he wanted. <laughs> Which sounds like a good idea, but it's not, okay? Don't do that. When you die, your friends should be allowed to come and be sad and not have to pretend that they're having a good time. But if you do have the fun roll, don't fucking play In My Life by the Beatles, all right? Because that's a goddamn crying song, okay? I could be having sex while eating a snow cone, which is my happy place. And if that song came on, I'd be bawling in either sense of the word. <laughs> so we, they're, they're putting together the services for Dale, and his, uh, his widow says, uh, hey Matt, uh, Dale always loved your music. Would you put together a little band, come and play for Dale? And Matt says, of course, for Dale. But fuck yeah, you know. And, uh, and then she turns to John and says, John, Dale always loved your poetry. Would you come read some poems for Dale? Yeah, for Dale. Hell yes. She turns to me, she says, Keith, Dale was a big fan of yours. Would you come give a small performance for Dale? And I said, it would be an honor. Of course I would. And then the intelligent part of my brain started screaming from inside my skull, it's a fucking funeral, asshole. You're a comedian. <laughs> what the fuck are we going to do? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> So I get there, I go hide in the office so I can cry when they play the Beatles, and then it's my turn, and I walk up, and the first thing I noticed when I got on stage is that the audience was much older than myself, much older demographic, and I thought, shit, maybe there's some business in this performing and funerals thing. Uh, folks, I have business cards in the back if you'd like to talk, and we can arrange some future gigs. <laughs> You gotta see business coming. You gotta stay ahead of the curve. <laughs> but then uh, I get up there and, and I say to the audience, uh, as most of you know, I'm, I'm an atheist and I'm, and I'm raising my daughter with a lot of different beliefs than, than you. But I want you to know that thanks to Dale, my daughter does believe in a, in a kind and generous wonderful man named Santa Claus. And they went, oh. And then for the first time in my adult life, my filter kicked in. It's the only time it's ever happened. And I didn't say the next line, which was, and also thanks to Dale, she will forever believe that Santa Claus died when she was two. <laughs> which is gonna save us a bundle of money. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> a good man. Uh, I mentioned my daughter. She's a tiger. I don't know if I had mentioned that, that my daughter is a tiger. Uh, she's a tiger because she decided she liked tigers and she wanted to be a tiger. She came to me and said, Dad, I'm a tiger. And I just believe in that kind of self-actualization. So I said, hell yeah, you're a tiger. <laughs> my little tiger has three grandmas. She's lucky, a lot of kids only get to have two grandmas, but she has three grandmas because grandpa doesn't know how to behave himself. <laughs> and the three grandmas didn't know that they were gonna get a tiger, of course, so they buy her really boring little girl presents that are of no use to a tiger. <laughs> like the three baby dolls that just sit on her bed, ignored all the time. Until a couple of weeks ago, when I see her walking down the hallway pulling a box 
with all three baby dolls nestled inside. Little blankets made for them out of washcloths. I said, oh, sweetheart, that's great. You're playing with your baby dolls. She says, tiger food, Dad. <laughs> I was in the other room. All right, the tiger's got to eat. You know? So I did what a responsible parent in 2013 does. I ran and I grabbed a camera and I started recording her because I need the YouTube hits. <laughs> And I see the most amazing and perplexing thing. She takes a baby doll, she walks it over to a filing cabinet, she opens a drawer, she puts the baby doll inside, and she shuts the drawer. And I said, well, what are you doing, sweetheart? And she says, oh, I'm cooking them, Daddy. <laughs> oh. Well, okay. <laughs> Let's see how deep this rabbit hole goes. <laughs> So, sweetie, how do you cook a baby girl? <laughs> I know it was wrong to ask, but was, what was really wrong was how quickly she answered. <laughs> oh, about two hours. <laughs> or until they stop squirming. <laughs> yeah. For real. Wait till you hear that shit come out of your baby girl's mouth. You know? <laughs> People ask me if that worries me. No, it doesn't worry me. It shouldn't worry me. It's just an unbridled imagination. It's just we haven't squashed that wonderful imagination by telling her that it's wrong. <laughs> oh, thanks. That's not expected. <laughs> and I'm really going to look forward to seeing where that imagination takes her. I'm really excited to see where she goes with that imagination, and I'm going to be proud of her. I'm going to be proud of her no matter where it takes her. That's me, the proud dad. And my friends say, oh, no matter where it takes her? And I said, yeah, no matter where it takes her. And being the assholes that they are, they say, oh yeah, well, what if she becomes a serial killer? To which I say, well, female serial killers are rare. <laughs> it's my precious gem. <laughs> I can just see myself bragging someday. Oh, excuse me, that's um, actually 17 known victims. <laughs> it's my tiger. <laughs> She's a great kid. She's a great kid. It's, it's confusing explaining to her what I do for a living. <laughs> Oh, honey, I, I walk up in front of people and say weird stuff. A lot of times about you, and they laugh and give me money. <laughs> That's she thinks the world is much cooler than it actually is. But I got up one morning and I, I had a goal for the day, which was to write at least one solid joke that I'd be comfortable using on stage. Just one non-throwaway joke that I could use on stage. And I, and I walk out of the kitchen, my wife and my daughter are already up, and she's having breakfast. And she looks up at me and says, Daddy, I wish that I had tongues on the bottom of my feet so I could kick things and taste them. <laughs> to which I said, good night. Because <laughs> I wasn't going to top that. <laughs> was not going to be beat. And people worry that I get material from her. They're like, oh, are you exploiting her? And it's like, no, she's just on my writing staff. Calm down. <laughs> she gets paid in oatmeal with raisins, and she has full health and dental, which means that she's doing better than most of the comics I know. <laughs> she's all right. Bedtime stories can be an issue. I don't like a lot of the traditional bedtime stories. I find them sexist. I don't want to teach her that if she gets into trouble, she better hope that some douchebag prince comes along and saves her. There's a little classism in there, too. You don't need some rich fuck. <laughs> They're pretty useless anyway. Sorry, sorry. Getting carried away. Uh, but she, she wants bedtime stories. So I told her uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Um, and that kept us busy for a few months. And she loved it. If I'm carrying her, and she goes, Sam, 
we're almost there. But I know that she has become Frodo, and that's the game we're playing now. Uh, I started telling her about Star Wars, uh, and I skipped the prequels because they suck, and I went right into the good ones. And, oh, you're so predictable, skeptics. <laughs> She right away fixates on Princess Leia. And why, why shouldn't she? You know, Princess Leia was a badass. She had cinnamon buns for hair, it was cool, she carried a pistol. My daughter said, Daddy, I'm Princess Leia. I was like, awesome, sweetheart, you're Princess Leia. And she said, and you're Princess Leia's daddy. <laughs> to which I said, oh, uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> Princess Leia's daddy is actually uh, Darth Vader. <laughs> she says, ha ha, a bad guy, dad. That's flattering. <laughs> so I put on my best Vader voice, which admittedly isn't very good, and I said, Leia, do you want to be one of the bad guys? Do you want to join the dark side? And she said, I uh, know daddy, because I'm a girl. <laughs> And I'm good. And I said, you can blow up planets. And she said, okay. She was in. I didn't have to cut off her hand or nothing. She was just down. Oh, man, Darth Vader, you went after the wrong kid. Those movies could have ended so differently. Little flaming Ewoks flying every which way, it would have been awesome. <laughs> so, uh, my wife and I are about to celebrate our 20th anniversary together, which is cool. She's a wonderful woman. Thanks. Uh, I'm very proud of it, especially because uh, I'm just so proud to be affiliated with her. But it's also weird telling people, saying that I've been in a heterosexual monogamous relationship for two decades, because I think it makes me sound like I'm really boring in the bedroom. I mean, if you had to guess a two decades heterosexual monogamous relationship, you'd probably think this guy's pretty vanilla between the sheets. Not true, okay? <laughs> I'm kinky as fuck, all right? My big kick is, I just really want to bang an old lady. And I'm super patient. <laughs> if anyone's still working on that one, uh, you'll know you got it when you realize that it's like actually a very sweet joke. It's, I think it's probably the most romantic way that anyone has ever said the words, I want to bang an old lady. <laughs> if anyone from Hallmark is here and you're hiring, <laughs> I'll take the gig. If I was a woman, I would say things like, God damn, my period's so heavy, it's an exclamation point. Uh. <laughs> Which is to say, I think I'd make a pretty good woman. <laughs> but I'm not a woman. I'm just married to an awesome woman. And every once in a while, that awesome woman needs me to go to the store and buy feminine hygiene products. When she needs that, I just do it. I don't act like some immature little boy and go, Oh, it's embarrassing. I don't want to buy those. No, and it shouldn't be embarrassing. You should go buy them with pride. She could buy them and be like, yeah, that's right, I got a lady at home. See, this is, I'm buying this because I got one of them ladies to tolerate me. <laughs> I mean, we're not children, we're adults. And I just go on and on like this for a long time about how great I am because actually I really don't want to go buy that stuff because I get embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> But I understand, she doesn't want to go out. She's uncomfortable already, she's in sweatpants. Uh, I go and I cross the park and I go to the little store to buy them. And as I'm approaching the little store, I catch myself going, oh man, 
sandwich girls don't be here, sandwich girls don't be here. Because <laughs> there's these three really cute sandwich girls that work at the little store and I just don't want to buy feminine hygiene products from them because I'm a moron. And I get to the door and I hear Iron Maidens run to the hills fucking blasting and I go, yes, heavy metal guys working alone. Uh, <laughs> Because they play Katy Perry and shit. They don't let him have his Iron Maiden when they're working. So I walk in, and I grab the products that my wife requested, and then I catch myself doing something weird where I knock a can of Coke into the basket, and I go over and I put a chocolate bar in the basket. Like shit that I don't even eat. But I guess I'm looking for camouflage. Like surely he won't notice it between these sweet treats. So I put it all in the counter, and Heavy Metal Guy doesn't give a shit. He wants to get back to reading Guitar Player magazine. He just throws his stuff in a bag and he charges me my money. And he doesn't even say hello or goodbye. He hasn't spoken a word to me until I get to the door. At which point I hear this. So Keith, you bleeding? <laughs> I said, like a stuck pig I am, and I ran. <laughs> My dad was really shitty about talking to us about sex. My mom gave my three older brothers a sex talk. She told my dad it was time for him to grow the fuck up, and that he had to talk to me and my little brother. I'm gonna give you guys a sex talk uh, the way that my father gave it to me. So you guys, you are. Uh, You know about sex, right? <laughs> All right, good. Oh, listen, if you have any questions, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Don't fucking ask you. <laughs> you had five kids on accident. You are not someone I'm gonna trust with that information. <laughs> you got some piece of it horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> So my mom had gone out of town, it was just me and my little brother and my dad alone in the house, and my little brother comes walking out, and he's got some maxi pads. And he says, hey dad, what are these? You're on, dad, <laughs> what are those? <laughs> if we have any questions. <laughs> my dad saw us, uh, those are band-aids for women. <laughs> band-aids for women, <laughs> you asshole. <laughs> My little brother goes and he puts him back and he goes out and he skateboards. And I guess he eats shit while he's skateboarding. Because I see him again a few minutes later with his board tucked under his arm and maxi pads just stuck all over his legs. I kick my dad. Dad. My dad turns and looks, what the fuck are you doing? My brother says, what? We were all out of dude band-aids. That's what we call a teachable moment. My dad was on. My dad did the right thing. He said, oh, all right. <laughs> and he sent my little brother out in the world to get tough. <laughs> it worked. He's a tough kid. When, uh, when I was a kid, I went to church camp. Uh, and just out of curiosity, how many of you guys have been to church camp? Yeah, it's a really good place to become an atheist. We should, we should like sponsor a church camps. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I went to church camp and, and I, I like swimming, but I'm not comfortable with the water. And, and so I would get up really early in the morning and then I could go swim in the pool in the middle of the woods. It's beautiful, nobody else would be around. Uh, I get up and I go to the pool one morning and there's somebody already there swimming. But I was like, oh, well, they probably are here for the same reason as me, so maybe I'll go sit there and make them uncomfortable and they will leave. <laughs> I was learning about generosity. <laughs> so I go in and I sit down, and this woman jumps in the pool and she swims across to the other side of the pool and then she gets out of the pool and I realize that she's wearing a t-shirt, just, just a t-shirt. I don't know if you guys understand what happens when a t-shirt gets wet. There's competitions and everything. I, I don't know if she was training to do it competitively, but... She then walked by me, which, barely a teenager, I... Uh, <laughs> and 
she gets to the other side of the pool and she jumps in again and she swims across again and she gets out again and she starts to do it again and I'm like, I know she saw me the first time. So that could have been an accident, but now she knows I'm here. And I start to think, she knows I'm watching. At this point, she's doing this for me, for my benefit. And that's really exciting to a young teenage boy. And she walks by again, and she jumps in the pool again, and she gets out on the other side. And I'm really sorry to admit this, but keep in mind that I was really young. That was the first time that I looked up at her face. Oh, shit. I know her. That's my friend, Sue. Sue is developmentally disabled, which all of a sudden completely fucked up my idea of consent. And I thought, I'm taking advantage of my disabled friend. She didn't know what she was doing, and I exploited her. And I was a neurotic kid anyway, so I'm having these horrible feelings of guilt. The worst part about it, though, was that I wasn't feeling guilt with my whole being. There was one part of me that was still pretty fucking enthusiastic about this. I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Do you have a soul? Shut up! It's an almost naked woman! So I'm fighting with my penis, and Sue walks by again. She jumps in the water again, and I keep watching. I can't stop watching. I'm just feeling terrible and conflicted and not very Christ-like. <laughs> And then I see Kenny, one of the counselors, walk in. He sits down, and that's what counselors are there for, to help us through these crises. So I walk over to Kenny, and I go, hey, Kenny. He goes, what's up, little dude? And I say, oh, can I talk to you for a minute? And Kenny says, sure. And I sit down next to Kenny, and he says, hey, check out my knee, bro. And Kenny had put a big gash in his knee while skateboarding, and he hadn't taken very good care of it. And now it was all inflamed and swollen up. And I looked at it, and Kenny said, doesn't it look like a pussy? And I had a two-part response. The first part was, I don't know. And the second part was, oh God, I hope not. And then Kenny started doing what can only be described as the world's most surreal ventriloquist act. Hello, Keith. I am Pussy Knee. Give me a kiss. Kiss the Pussy Knee, Keith. My reaction finally went away, so that was good. That was helpful. And then one of the female counselors came out and put a towel around Sue and led her away to explain undergarments to her and I went back to my cabin and masturbated and I've been an atheist ever since. <laughs> I'll tell you guys a story uh, about my uh, one brief run-in with Scientology. Uh, I was an 18-year-old delinquent out getting drunk with a friend of mine, Sacramento is not the most entertaining town for an 18 year old with no money. Uh, so we're walking and the Scientologists stand out in front of their little Scientology storefronts that they have and try to coax you in. And it reminds me a lot of the women that stand in front of strip clubs in North Beach of San Francisco <laughs> and try to get you to come in and look at the strippers. The main difference being those women are telling you the truth, you know. <laughs> I, I was walking through North Beach once and a woman ran out and yelled, oh my God, Candy's about to set her nipples on fire and ran back in and the street just fucking emptied into the club. Because <laughs> we were all concerned. We had our fire extinguishers ready and... But you can bet, sure as fuck, that when you got in there, Candy was setting her goddamn nipples on fire. I mean, they fucking deliver what they say they're gonna deliver. Scientology, not so much. The guy asks me, hey, you wanna come in and take a free personality test? And I go, oh shit, yeah, I do. And so I follow him in, and he tells me that my friend, Christian, can't take the test, because he's too drunk. And I said, ha ha, you lush. And so we put Christian in this room to watch movies, 
And he took me into the room to do the test, and I held some things in my hands, and he asked me questions, and a little needle bounced around, and it was fun for a minute. And then afterwards, he pulls my little diagram out that I apparently had made with my answers, and it looked like this. And I said, hey, that looks pretty good. Uh, did I pass? <laughs> he says, no, no, that's bad. It's bad. Well, what does yours look like? I showed him mine, so it made sense he should show me his. <laughs> his just went like this, much more graceful. And he said, that's after years of work. He said, the ideal would be to get to this. I said, no, no, I've seen that fucker. That's flatline. That's <laughs> like, I don't know what they told you, bro, but you get there no matter what. That just happens. <laughs> There's no escaping it. If they told you there was a way around it, they fucking lied. He says, no, no, these are the high points and the low points of your life. And I go, well, I got a lot more high points than you, fucker. <laughs> you know, I still think I'm winning. And he says, yeah, but wouldn't you like to get rid of this low point here? And I said, not at the expense of that high point there. Because <laughs> I think I remember that one. Well, he gets flustered and he decides he's had enough of me. So as he's walking me out, we stop and we get my friend Christian from where he's watching movies. And me and Christian walk out and we get about a block away. And Christian goes, hey, bro, hey, bro. And he shows me that he had stolen a copy of Dianetics. <laughs> and he explained it to me like it was the crime of the century. Dude. So there were five of them up on the piano, evenly spaced. I took the one in the middle. Most people wouldn't have thought of this, but I actually moved the other ones in a little bit. So we went and bribed some homeless people to buy us more liquor, and then we went back to our apartment, and we passed out. And I woke up in the morning, Took that second to figure out where I was. Looked to my left, and there's my best friend Christian looking back at me with a book of Dianetics in between us. And I went, oh fuck, what did we do? <laughs> we went out last night and joined a cult. <laughs> then I was like, oh fuck it, they can't do anything to us. We don't have any money for them to take. <laughs> so we grabbed the book of Dianetics, and we walked to a used bookstore, and uh, as we walk in, the dude that owned the bookstore, big beard, pet in a cap, just the perfect stereotypical bookstore owner reading some the heavy shit that we can never understand. And we walk up, and uh, Christian says, uh, hey, we're wondering if you want to buy this book. And the dude, without even looking up, just points. And we follow his fingers up, and we see a shelf over the front door of the bookstore that has six copies of Dianetics. <laughs> and a note taped to them with a single word. No! <laughs> so we left and we gave the book to a homeless dude that was sitting outside, and I'm pretty sure he's a senator now. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got this. <laughs> you guys get the robo calls? You get those calls on the phone from robots? I, uh, I try to enjoy him, I try to appreciate him. The thing is you gotta keep a childlike sense of wonder alive. Think about it, when you were a kid, if they would have told you that in the future, you would get phone calls from robots, <laughs> that shit would have sounded way more exciting than it has actually turned out to be. <laughs> I was getting this one over and over again. We're answering the phone and this voice says, Google, that's right, Google. Oh, hello, Google. <laughs> and we got it so much that it became a thing around my house. Like I would walk in and see my wife and say, Google. And her and my daughter would say, that's right, Google. <laughs> and that's just how we greeted each other. One day I get the call, Google, that's right, Google. I'm like, okay, this was funny, but now I'm done. You know, so I wait and I hear the recorded message and it gives me some options, you know. But I'm a little to be annoyed in Spanish. 
I hit the right button to talk to a live operator. The operator comes on and says, do you want to be on the front page of Google? I'm like, oh shit, it's a dude that recorded the message. And I realized at that point that I'd acted hastily. I hadn't thought of anything clever to say. But what am I going to do? I'm not just going to yell at the poor guy. He's just doing his job, right? And I'm a comedian. I'm supposed to be quick on my feet. I should have something clever to say. So I say, Google! And he goes, yes, Google! And he gets excited. I'm thinking this is the most enthusiasm he's heard all day. So I give him another one, Google! And I hear scurrying around him like the other operators are coming to listen. Like, Jeff's got one on the line! He's gonna reel it in! And he just launches into this big thing about algorithms and all this other shit and how they can put me on top. And it's weird because they're used to just trying to talk as much as they can before you hang up. And if you don't hang up, they get confused and they'll stumble right into personal shit. You know? <laughs> like, I work really hard at this job and sometimes my wife doesn't appreciate it. She's like, you get to sit down for a living. But I'm like, hey, you gotta face a lot of rejection. It's tough. And uh, anyway, would you like to go on the front page of Google? His talk was really sophisticated, considering that so far I had presented myself as an enthusiastic caveman. <laughs> I know. But I think it over carefully, and I say to him, mm, mm, Google. <laughs> and he says, yeah, <laughs> Google. And I say, Google! Google, 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 Google. <laughs> and he goes, ah. Uh, Google. And then I remembered something that a friend of mine who did phone work had told me, which is that they're not allowed to hang up. And I had shit to do that night. I was like, cool, I'm in this for the long haul. <laughs> Google! So he's reading their entire book to me. He's trying everything. He's fucking desperate. He asks me if I want something to drink. It's going on and on, and I'm just Google, 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 Google. And then he says, uh, "Yeah, you know, we can we can also get you on the front page of Yahoo." <laughs> At which point I kind of took offense, <laughs> and I said, "Google." <laughs> And then an amazing thing happened. He started playing along. And in a perfect Clint Eastwood, he said, Yahoo. <laughs> and I said, Google! And he said, Yahoo, Yahoo, Yahoo! And I said, Googly, 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 Googly. And two grown men. <laughs> Spent like three solid minutes yelling nonsensical but heavily patented nonsense words at one another. And it was beautiful. And then something that delighted me happened. He said, All right, brother, you have a good weekend. <laughs> and he hung up. I won! <laughs> Victories that count. <laughs> but I thought about it and I was like, man, the, the best part about this is that we played like children. Like we just played like a couple little kids and tapped our imagination and went to town. That's not something we do enough as adults. And I thought that was actually kind of a beautiful accidental moment. And I decided to tell the story on stage. I decided to blog about it. I decided to share it as much as I could. Because my thinking was, what if I could get it to go viral and it got back to him? And he got in touch with me. I'm on the road all the time. I could end up in his town. We could have a drink together. It would be cool. And then I thought, what I really need to do is to figure out how to get this story on the front page of Google. <laughs> Anyone? Something about algorithms, I don't know. They don't call me anymore. I'm doing on time here. 
Um, I have to ask a favor. Uh, it can start here with us, but I'd like this to spread to the whole world. Um, could we start a campaign? I think a lot of campaigns are too ambitious when they try to achieve world peace in any permanent sense. Let's pick a year. Let's just pick one year. And for one year, all of the people of the planet not be assholes to each other. Just a fucking year. Because we are eventually going to invent time travel, and it'd be really nice to have somewhere to go to. <laughs> what I love about atheist crowds is that someone right now is tweeting, more like some time to go to, buddy. <laughs> some when to go to. I'm uh, rereading 1984 by George Orwell, which is a great book, and it's fun to read on this side of 1984. Because there's parts of it that are a little bit silly, like George Orwell supposed that by this point in our history, we would all be speaking in some kind of hyper-efficient newspeak. And when I read that, I have to tell you, I just LMAO. <laughs> I just LOL and L and L and L. And it's interesting because the thing that Orwell missed that he never could have guessed was that we would all go out and buy the cameras ourselves. <laughs> and then our biggest fear would be that no one's watching. <laughs> Love me. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I really like music a lot. I defend myself that I'm not a music snob when I get called a music snob, and then I realize that I can't, when I hear a song that I don't like on the radio, I can't change the radio station without telling the song to shut up first. <laughs> it's like, shut up! And I was like, oh, okay, maybe a little bit of music snob. Uh, I really love the band Joy Division, and I really love the band New Order, but I've come <laughs> this could be bigger than the red and blue thing. <laughs> I've come to realize that I actually like New Order a little bit better. And I feel guilty about that because it's kind of like saying that I think Ian Curtis made the right decision. <laughs> you hear those five people groaning? They got the joke. <laughs> Look at where they are, have them explain it to you afterwards. The thing is, not every joke can be for every person. And I'm okay with that. It's all right if some of them don't work on you. The great behavioralist B.F. Skinner experimented with pigeons and discovered that inconsistent rewards are actually more effective in establishing behavior patterns. Otherwise, all my jokes would be awesome. <laughs> All right, let's get into the depressing part of the evening. <laughs> I've been doing some writing. Been doing some writing. I'm working on a country song. Uh, I've only got the title, but I think it's pretty good. It's called Her Safe Word Was Goodbye. <laughs> if anyone knows how to play a couple of chords on the guitar and some words that rhyme with goodbye, hit me up in the lobby. I think we could have a hit. I've also been writing a lot of suicide notes lately. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> I'm not overly depressed or anything, I just think it's underappreciated art form, and I thought I'd take a stab at it. <laughs> my favorite one I've come up with so far just says, Goodbye, you can have my records, but I'm taking all my pills. <laughs> Kisses. I wrote that one and I was like, damn, that's pretty good. I might have to do this. <laughs> I do suffer from depression sometimes, I think. I'm never sure if it's depression or just sadness that has a reason and is, you know, valid. Like, you should be sad. That sucks. For instance, I went to buy life insurance. Uh, if you're not rich and you have a kid, you have to buy life insurance. It's very important, lest you be an asshole. 
So I went to take care of that, and I'm sitting with the insurance broker, a uh, very nice lady, well-dressed, smelled like soap, and she's explaining this stuff to me, and she's using numbers bigger than numbers I've ever dealt with in my life. I don't own a home, I've never owned a car that wasn't a Volkswagen bus or a hand-me-down from my mom. Like, I don't understand these kind of numbers. But as she's throwing these numbers at me, it occurs to me, oh shit, I'm actually worth something if I die. <laughs> and because I have no filter, I say this out loud. And she replies, well, suicide's not covered for the first 48 months. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> She's telling me I can kill myself in four years. <laughs> there are 17 months left. I did not intend to start that countdown. But it's impossible not to keep track. <laughs> like, to me, every calendar has now become the world's most morbid advent calendar. <laughs> Instead of a piece of chocolate under each date, there's like a Prozac or something, I don't know, it's a loft. Um, and if I'm concerning any of you, you don't have to worry about me. I'm not actually a suicide risk. Uh, I could never kill myself because my mom is still alive. And that would be rude. <laughs> and I have a daughter. And you can't do that. That would just be horrible. You can't kill yourself when you have a kid. I realized the other day that I chose not to have a child until I was 38 years old. And I was questioning why I waited so long and I'm worried that at least on some subconscious level, I might have been trying to run down the clock on mom. <laughs> Sometimes they're just for Floyd. <laughs> uh, when I get suicidal thoughts and impulses, it's never because something really bad happened. You know, if someone I loved left me or if I lost someone important to me, I know how to deal with that kind of grief. I know how to get on top of it. You know, in fact, those are the moments when I might feel most alive. I always get suicidal thoughts because of embarrassment. That's the number one thing, it's just because I get embarrassed. Like, uh, if I bomb in front of an audience, no pressure. Uh, or like if I fart at a party. Like I have social anxiety and I think so much of it is centered around, oh my god, what if I fart? You know, like, that's actually kept me from doing things in my life. Like if I walked into a party and someone was like, oh, Keith, Keith, this is Matt, Matt, this is Keith, and I went, I'd be like, oh shit, walk outside, just boom, just fucking blow my brains out on the lawn in hopes that the next day nobody would be talking about the fact that I farted at the party. <laughs> and like, oh, yeah, Keith blew his brains out, kind of put a downer on things. Uh, but what would probably actually happen is people would be like, it was fucking amazing, Keith walked in the room, fucking ripped one, went outside, boom, just told us all to fuck ourselves. That's what I think he was saying. It's amazing. <laughs> but I'll show you the most embarrassing moment that I've had in recent years. Uh, I went to the gastroenterologist. I have a condition called ulcerative colitis. It's uh, well managed, thank you science. Um, but uh, it means that I have to go to the doctor and get a finger stuff up, stuffed up my ass a little more frequently than most of you might. You get used to it, it's not that bad. I never realized I could have that position, uh, but life happens and, and you learn to adapt. When I was a kid, one time I was playing with a friend named Keith McNeil, and his father came home, and his dad says, or I say to his dad, how do you doing, Mr. McNeil? And he says, terrible. Just got the doctor's fingers stuffed up my ass. And I said, oh God, why? And he said, to make sure I don't have ass cancer. Oh, the innocence of youth. I replied, fuck that, I'd rather have ass cancer. <laughs> the universe heard me, it's like, boom, lots of fingers in your future. <laughs> 
So I go into the gastroenterologist, and like I said, I, I just, it's an everyday thing. It happens a lot, and I try to be mature, and I try to just deal with it. So I walk in, and uh, the doctor does the things he always does. He goes through the little ritual. He comes over, he feels my lymph nodes, and he sees if I have any tenderness under my ribs, and then he turns around and has a little counter, which I know means that he's going to put a glove on and get the lube. And so I undo my belt, and I undo my pants, and I unzip my fly, and I open that up, and he turns around and he goes, no, 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 not today. <laughs> zip my pants back up, a little zip of shame, while he stands there and watches. And I button my pants, redo my belt, Feeling as if I've been rejected by some dick whose finger I never wanted in my fucking ass to begin with. <laughs> fucking kill me. I'm gonna take a minute and open another water, Lauren. Push ups. That's not the finger they use, Lauren. <laughs> As far as I know, I don't, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Dr. Meanie Fingers. <laughs> if anyone's wondering why I've spent so much time talking about suicide and depression, I am working on my Christmas album. <laughs> that mind. So, uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. I may be closing up here. Um, so, uh, there is hope. There is hope. I, uh, I had a breakthrough recently, and I think I'm, I'm getting on top of this. I, I figured out what happened with me, and that is just that my life peaked a little bit early. Which is the thing that happens. Your life can peak early, and you gotta keep on living. John Cougar Mellon Camp wrote a song about it once, it was great. Uh, and I'll tell you about when my life peaked. When I was in the fourth grade, I would go have lunch in the school's little open lunch yard area, and seagulls would fly around our heads, and we would throw them pizza crusts. And for a fourth grader, that's ideal. Like, it was just awesome. And then one day, I walk out there, and there's a sixth grader with a handful of pebbles, and he's throwing them at the seagulls. And I think, what an asshole. But I also realized he didn't have much of a pitching arm or anything else to give him any self-esteem, which is usually the case with dicks like that. So I just went and had a seat. But then he hit one of the seagulls, just by dumb luck. And he hit it hard. And the seagull cried. Have you guys ever heard a seagull cry? I don't mean that little noise they make that says, throw me another pizza crust. I'm talking a sound of betrayal. This horrible, sad sound. I'm sorry, Prince. I'm sure when doves cry, it's fucking heartbreaking. But this shit turned me inside out. This is what you should have wrote a song about. This sad seagull. And I turn to look at the sixth grader and I'm expecting to see remorse. And instead, he goes, yeah, buddy, I got one. And he puts his hand out for me to give him five. And at exactly that second, a bird shit in his hand. And I said, man, that was fucking awesome. <laughs> Damn, it's probably the best thing I've ever been seeing in my life. <laughs> Fuck, I might have could have wanted to save that. <laughs> There's a documentary that I saw on the Discovery Channel about the men that had actually walked on the surface of the moon. And these men that walked on the surface of the moon, and by the way, did you know for every moon mission there were two men that walked on the surface of the moon and one who never got to get out of the car? <laughs> this is true, what a shitty gig. Like, yeah, I was on the moon. I mean, I only saw it through a little screen, not even as nice as the one you guys watched on down on Earth, but I was there, I was there. You told me I was there, I don't know. Might have just been a sound stage in New Mexico, but it was supposedly half there. But these men that actually walked on the surface of the moon, they got to look back and see planet Earth, little blue marble floating in space, 
When they came back to Earth, they suffered from this kind of depression that hadn't been seen before, and it's been named the Moon Man Syndrome. Because what the fuck do you do when you've walked on the moon? You know, that kind of spoils you for other shit. Do your laundry? No, we go to separate the colors from the white. I mean, it's, it's a sad thing. And these men are describing this feeling. And they're zooming in on their, their big, sad, lost eyes. And I find myself thinking, yeah. I got you. I once saw a bird shit on a sixth grader. <laughs> and now mind you, I'm not saying I haven't had other incredible moments in my life, because that would be dishonest of me. I've had amazing moments. I stood two feet from the woman I love while she looked me in the eye and said, I do. That was a pretty incredible day, and a short time later, I was an equal distance from her as my child, who I love dearly, came into existence, born from my wife's body. That was an amazing day. But the thing that you have to understand about all this is that the bird just shit right the fuck in his hand at exactly the right goddamn second. It was a perfectly executed avian revenge shit vibe, and I was fucking there to see it. Front and center. Thank you, guys. I'll say that. Hey, uh, you said I could go all night. I, I mean, doing comedy. Uh, I just, I just want to throw one. I just want to throw one last night that occurred to me, and I haven't told it in a while. And then I want to talk to them about their money. Um, so I went. I went to the liquor store, and uh, first of all, I walked in, and there's this uh, man who was an immigrant, and he maybe didn't know all of our uh, words and colloquialisms, but he was dusting his racks of porn. Dusting them off. Now I'm a comedian. And when you walk in and you see some dude cleaning up his porn, like that's just, my head almost exploded. <laughs> but the best I could muster up at the moment was, hey, you can clean that all day, buddy, it's still gonna be filthy. <laughs> to which he said, no, I keep a clean store. <laughs> Never mind, buddy. <laughs> but I can't take a loss. So I have to keep trying. So I get up to the counter and I see that he's selling Karma Sutra incense. And I said, huh, Karma Sutra incense, huh? That's interesting. It's one dollar. Okay, I know, listen. It's just funny to me because I know what the Karma Sutra is. And when I think about the Karma Sutra, I think, man, I, I like the way that looks. That looks pretty good. And I'll tell you what, if I could hear it, I'd probably like the way it sounded. Probably like all those moans and groans and happy noises. But you know what's never ever occurred to me about the Karma Sutra? I've never thought, geez, I'd like my living room to smell like that. <laughs> you have anything that can make my house smell like a bunch of gymnasts just came over and fucked in it? <laughs> Wrap it up, one dollar. Um, but I do want to talk to you guys about it real quick. Uh, the speakers volunteer to come here and, and this is a wonderful event, and they're very generous. They, they put us up in a room and they fly us out, and I love that. And, and we return the generosity by waiving our speaker fees, and we come and perform for free. Uh, but we also sell shit, and that's a wonderful way to support us and help us be able to take a week away from our weekend, away from what we normally do. So um, buy my shit, <laughs> and buy shit from other speakers. I have three CDs out and a couple of DVDs, uh, including Elf Orgy, which is my newest, if you guys haven't picked it up. Uh, and I'll have that here. So I'm Keith Jensen. Thank you guys so much. Good night. <laughs>